Demonstrators attack the site of a nuclear power station in West Germany. 10,000 protesters turned out here at Gründer near Hanover earlier this year to show their feelings against a planned nuclear power centre. So strong was their protest that police had to use tear gas and water cannons to drive them back from the site. Thirty-two years after the atomic bomb brought a cataclysmic end to the Second World War, peaceful applications of its technology are raising serious doubts about safety and security for future generations. Soon after this protest, West German authorities ordered a halt to virtually all nuclear power plant construction, even though one of the country's leading research foundations said atomic power was essential to Germany's continued economic development. Gründer's not the only place in West Germany where the nuclear controversy is being hotly debated. Environmentalists are also concerned about plans to create a dumping ground for highly radioactive fuel waste at Gorleben on the East German border. It's a scheme based on the results of a long-term experiment in the Asser Hills. A disused salt mine here has been used for dumping low and intermediate level radioactive waste from West Germany's 11 nuclear power plants, as well as from several research laboratories too. Scientists claim that rock salt layers deep underground are the best way of solving humanity's biggest rubbish disposal problem, because salt stops the escape of radioactivity, which can stay dangerous for tens of thousands of years. The salt mine experiment is the most sophisticated deep burial site for spent nuclear fuel in the West, and probably the world. Experts stress it's only a small-scale trial for a major installation planned for the 1990s. Strict precautions are taken with the specially packaged waste at Asa. Intermediate level waste arrives with two to three tons of concrete jacketing around the drums to absorb radiation. Low level material is placed in unjacketed steel drums. This disposal unit does not yet receive the high level radioactive waste produced from the new generation of plutonium fast breeder reactors. But in the early 1980s, this most deadly atomic material will be put here in experimental deep shafts dug below the lowest point of the mine, which is two and a half thousand feet deep. Once the waste has been loaded onto the mine's lift, the pithead wheels start rolling. 45 seconds later, the material is 1,600 feet below the fields of Lower Saxony. Special vehicles take it still deeper underground, and the low-level material is then dumped among rock salt with no further precautions. But there is strict security for the intermediate fuel. It goes into special 50-foot pits at the bottom level of the mine, untouched by human hands. A television camera relays pictures to a technician remotely controlling an electronic magnet which lowers the containers to their final resting place. Egon Albrecht, the man in charge of the project, dismisses the dangers. We dispose here from uh, 67 up to day low and intermediate level waste in uh, underground in the mine. And we have had during the whole time no radiation outside the mine uh, and in the environment. A hundred miles from Asser, 
lies the controversial site the authorities want to use for a nuclear fuel reprocessing plant and underground dump. The planned centre near Gorleben would handle the highly dangerous fast breeder waste and this has provoked nationwide protest. Up till now, all West Germany's fast breeder fuel has been reprocessed abroad and the residue, which could be used to make nuclear weapons, dumped there. The site is under a mile from the border fence that separates East and West Germany and local residents object that the environmental risks could have serious political consequences. Gorleben was chosen because it has huge salt deposits at very low levels, 3,300 feet below the surface. Building work has started there already, despite the fact it is next to a nature reserve on which any kind of industry is forbidden. Several peaceful demonstrations have been held there recently. A children's playground has been built on the site by opponents who refuse to accept government assurances there is no danger. Protesters say people would refuse to buy local milk and other farm products and they have planted trees in a bid to disprove official claims that some of the sandy soil is useless for anything else. Nuclear waste, they say, threatens unborn generations. The whole fast breeder controversy derives from here, Britain's prototype at Doon Ray in the north of Scotland. Built nearly 20 years ago, this reactor was years ahead of the rest of the world. Dune Ray and the new fast breeder reactors now being considered in West Germany, Britain, the USA and elsewhere, don't need continuous supplies of uranium. Instead, once started, they run on plutonium. The fast breeder actually produces more fuel from its own waste and so never needs refueling. Dune Ray's proved it can produce electricity. It's fed more than 600 million watts of it into the national system. And it was, after all, designed only as a small experimental prototype. It's been closed down now, but it's proved its point. New, commercially viable, fast breeder reactors could be built. Those in favor of reactors like this argue they will be needed to meet demand for energy in the years ahead when fossilized fuels like oil or coal will either run out or at least become inadequate to fuel the world's industries. But the usefulness of nuclear capacity has to be balanced against other aspects like safety. It's not just a question of what to do with the radioactive waste that's produced but also any dangers inherent in the reactors themselves. Critics claim they could become potential H-bombs if anything went seriously wrong with them. At Doon Ray, safety has always been a major concern, and it's with some pride that Britain's Atomic Energy Authority says there's not been a single accident involving radiation in the 18 years Doon Ray's been operating. We asked an authority official what it had achieved. Well, I think the most important thing is it's proved that fast reactors can be run reliably and safely and are a perfectly satisfactory way of generating the electricity we require. That, I think, is far and away the most important thing this reactor has demonstrated. Here at Windscale in northwest England, the authority plans the next stage in Britain's nuclear development. There's been a plant here for years, processing spent fuel from British nuclear stations. Now the aim is to expand it. Some of the equipment needs replacing in any case, and there's a need for greater capacity. What has caused public concern, though, isn't that, but the suggestion that wind scale should reprocess nuclear materials from abroad, notably from Japan. That, critics claim, would make the area a little better than the world's nuclear dustbin.
The problem is, though the new reactors are more efficient than conventional ones, they produce a waste that's far more radioactive. After reprocessing, there's still a lot left over, and that's got to be disposed of safely. As yet, there's no fail-safe method, and in fact, there's already been a noticeable, though not dangerous, increase in traces of radioactivity in the wind scale area. Inside the plant, the tightest possible safety measures are taken. One in ten of the workers here are safety officers, monitoring the health of themselves and their fellows and watching for any rise in radioactivity. In fact, the level of radiation throughout the plant is continually checked and a loudspeaker system broadcasts Geiger counter readings so that everyone can be warned immediately if there's a sudden and potentially dangerous change. There are continual medical checks of the staff here. Two years ago, two former workers died within 24 hours of each other, one of them from leukemia. But Windscale's chief executive, Ned Franklin, denied their deaths had any connection with their occupation. Both of these people had been ill for a period of years and it is utterly coincidental that they came to die at the same time. One of them died of leukemia, the other one did not. Uh, it is known that from large doses of radiation, people can contract leukaemia. This is known from atomic bomb victims. What we can say is that in 20 odd years of operation of this factory, the number of cases of leukaemia arising here is no more than one would have expected, and indeed perhaps slightly less than one would have expected, from the same number of the population at large in the country. If the safety argument and all the others about wind scale are resolved, the expanded plant will look like this. It'll cost at least 600 million pounds and will provide a thousand jobs in an area of high unemployment. But there's still the problem of what to do with the processed waste. One suggestion is to sink it deep into granite rocks, which already emit a small but harmless amount of radioactivity. Scientists are now carrying out tests in a number of potential burial sites for the waste, such as here, in the hills of southwestern Scotland. They believe that dumping wouldn't cause any appreciable increase in the radioactivity that's already there naturally, particularly as the waste would be sealed in special containers way underground. The local population, though, are not convinced, and there's a vociferous protest campaign against even the preliminary test borings, quite apart from the dumping itself. The wind scale expansion plans have caused a major debate in Britain and the government set up a public inquiry. Those in favour of the expansion are convinced that fears of a catastrophe are groundless. Chief among them, Chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority, Sir John Hill. Our nuclear program has been going on for about 25 years. Our technology in 1950 was pretty rudimentary, but it was adequate for the small program we had in 1950. In the last 25 years, we've learned a vast amount, and our engineering has got better, and our safety has got better, and the Royal Commission acknowledges that the technology of 1976 is perfectly adequate for the program we've got in 1976. But of course our 1950 technology wouldn't be adequate. And I would contend that in the next 25 years to the year 2000, our technology will improve and will be completely adequate for the much larger nuclear power program of the year 2000. I think all the industrialized countries in the world have come to broadly the same conclusion that they're going to need progressively larger nuclear programs with the bulk of their electricity being produced by nuclear means by the end of the century. And I think if we delay now, we're either going to have to have a crash program later or we're going to have a very real energy shortage in perhaps 15 years' time. Others are less sanguine, like Sir Brian Flowers, chairman of the government's Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution. 
the plutonium economy that we talk about as being possible by the end of the century, uh, namely a state of affairs in which plutonium is the chief fuel and is perhaps transported around the world and is processed in different places and is in the hands of countries whose stability one can doubt, um, only because that re represents a very considerable escalation uh, in the risk from uh, terrorist and guerrilla activity. I think here one has to declare one's view of how the world is likely to be in 25 years' time. And I'm not an expert soothsayer, but it does seem to me plausible that this kind of uh, guerrilla life rather than major war is one that is going to be with us for a very long time. And that being so, I think you have to ask whether there is any risk of it being escalated by the presence of highly dangerous technological processes and products. Sir Brian's criticisms are more wide-ranging than just security, and they carry weight because he is himself a nuclear physicist. In fact, he's been a key figure in the campaign that led the government to set up the wind-scale inquiry. We asked him if he wasn't just being a scaremonger. I think it is perfectly true to say that in the normal course of events, if nuclear installations run as they're supposed to, there is no doubt that they are designed to the highest possible standards and that those standards are such that the environmental hazards associated with them are, I think I can use the word negligible, as compared to many other activities that we accept. Uh, one has to go further than that, however, and ask about the abnormal event. Um, and one also has to ask whether one is building something up for the future uh, without knowing quite what one is doing. And this is the point at which our anxiety comes in. It is the building up of so-called radioactive waste. This, this is the ash of the nuclear burning process um, and whose hazards uh, extend for, in some cases, depending on the substance, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, one is therefore clearly building up a commitment of hazard to future generations. And we believe that it is wrong to do that unless we have established that there is at least one way of dealing with the problem of disposing of these substances irrevocably and forever if future generations, if not ourselves, should wish to do so. That we should not produce them in huge quantities. We should not be committed to a program where the production of them was inevitable unless one has established that there is a way of dealing with them. Has opposition from people like Flowers made the government delay decisions on nuclear development? Environment Secretary Peter Shaw. Well, no. I think the, the next stage of nuclear power is, uh, well, it's one, a decision that was taken uh, in 1974 to go ahead with a modest uh, program uh, of thermal nuclear uh, power. And uh, we have yet, as it were, to go firm on the reactor system to be used. And I believe that decision will be taken in the reasonably near future, although it's for my colleague, the Energy Secretary, to announce it. But if you're saying, uh, do we now uh, envisage that other major uh, nuclear developments uh, should be, as it were, examined with greater uh, thoroughness and exposed to public debate in a way that we have not done previously until I myself set up the Windscale Inquiry, yes. Can you give us any assurances that Britain will not become a nuclear dumping ground? Well, that certainly would not be uh, uh, what I would want at all, and I don't see why it should happen. And uh, as you will know, if you're referring to a particular contract which the uh, Secretary of State for Energy um, uh, authorised, uh, I think, the BNFL to enter into with uh, the Japanese, he uh, uh, insisted that uh, in the clauses of that contract there should be uh, the um, uh, obligation, if we wished, uh, to return the materials uh, to Japan after reprocessing. The safety of nuclear power is also a controversial topic in America. A year ago, a coalition of environmentalist groups tried to get California to vote for safety guarantees so stringent that plants in the state would have been forced to close down. 
They lost, but they did get a lot of support, and the campaign for greater safety regulations goes on. And it's been given a boost by a President Carter's call for a tighter control on the development and use of plutonium-based reactors. Supporters of the development of fast breeders claim the odds against a catastrophe are 5 billion to 1. But there have already been nearly 200 threats of sabotage by criminals or extremists in America alone. The country's planned expansion figures make the odds a lot shorter. There could be as many as 600 new power stations in the next 25 years. And the amount of fuel for reprocessing throughout the world could rise from 2,000 tonnes a year now to 200,000 tonnes by the year 2000, an estimate the anti-nuclear campaigners say must increase the risks of accidents. One of America's most powerful campaigners in the anti-nuclear lobby is the consumer affairs advocate Ralph Nader. I think there are two issues, technical and economic. As far as the technical issues about the safety of nuclear power, there's general agreement that there are many serious unresolved problems. The storage of radioactive waste, the effectiveness of the emergency core cooling system. Where the disagreement comes is that the industry says, well, we'll solve these problems in good time. And the critics are saying, well, you solve them before you put these plants into operation, not after you put these plants in operation, because it could be too late. As far as the economics are concerned, I don't think there should be any disagreement. The costs of building these plants have, have tripled in the last five years. Uranium prices have tripled in the last 18 months. Uh, and it's a general uh, ass assessment of a McGraw-Hill publication, Electrical World, that nuclear power is the most expensive form of power in America today for any plants built after 1972. So people are going to pay as consumers and they're going to pay as taxpayers because there's a large taxpayer subsidy to the nuclear industry. Dr. Ralph Lapp, editor of a nuclear science journal, completely rejects Nader's criticisms of the expansion program. Well, Nader is saying that we don't need nuclear power, that it's unsafe, and it's unreliable. Uh, in point of fact, it's a very odd position for a consumer advocate like Ralph Nader to be advocating power that's going to be more expensive. We know nuclear is going to save us money. I calculate that in the five years ending 1980, we will save, for the American consumer, $13.7 billion by using nuclear power plants that we now have underway. But Dr. Lapp, what about the safety of nuclear power? That seems to be the big question. Well, of course, Ralph Nader is uh, pretty thin ice when he starts talking about a highly technical subject like this. These plants are safe. They're the most strictly regulated of any plant. Uh, there has never been an accident which released any significant amount of radioactivity. Certainly, this is carefully monitored, and there hasn't been any release which has been biologically significant. This plant at Brown's Ferry in Alabama has seen a potentially disastrous accident. A couple of years ago, a fire destroyed miles of electrical wiring and seven of the 12 safety systems failed, including the emergency pumps for the core cooling system, though there was no overheating of the reactor. One side claims it proves accidents are possible, the other that the safety systems do work. And so the argument about nuclear power as a whole, and fast breeders in particular, continues. People like Ralph Nader, though, think that whatever the precautions, there's no absolute guarantee of safety. There's always uh, a risk of accident because human beings have errors. They fail. They're fra frail. Uh, they make mistakes, quite apart from a politically unstable world that we live in. So it comes down to whether you think this technology is going to be perfect for all time, or whether you think, like all other technology in the history of mankind, there are going to be accidents. And the result is that in this technology, the potential for catastrophe is bigger than any other technology in the world. It could wipe out a state or wipe out a city and affect future generations with highly cancerous and genetically harmful ingredients. The problem is the world will need more energy, possibly twice as much by the end of the century and plutonium reactors could provide it. Every industrialized country is now trying to weigh the risks against the benefits. 
Some people believe the safety argument will never be satisfactorily resolved. Others that it can be, but only after much more research. Sir Brian Flowers again. Uh, yes, of course. And our report is, as a matter of fact, uh, rather optimistic about the possibility of uh, establishing, beyond reasonable doubt, that there are sa safe ways of uh, disposing of these very long-lived uh, radioactive wastes uh, forever. Uh,